Hello folks, welcome back to the Camping Astronomer channel. This video is the second video in a um, little three series video set that I'm doing on uh, the basics of how to use your map and compass. So um, let's get straight into it. My name is John and I make videos on camping, astronomy and walking. If you like what you see in this video, then please check my channel out as there may be others that interest you there. But in the meantime, let's crack on with today's video. So in part one, we had a little look at some of the features of a typical walking compass and ran through a real life scenario from a few years ago where it was handy to be able to actually use a map and compass. We showed how to take a bearing from the map using that scenario, account for magnetic variation if necessary, and how to walk on that bearing. Okay, so the part one video has got us our bearing and we're now walking along it, um, but it's useful to know where you are on that particular bearing leg at any given time. So the part two video will look at techniques we can use to figure out how far we've gone along a particular leg. And these are pacing techniques, and a timing technique called Naismith's rule. And we'll see how you can modify Naismith's rule to suit your particular style of walking. What we'll then do is look at the scenario from part one in the Lake District and apply Naismith's rule and the, the pacing techniques to that. And that wasn't a particularly serious situation, but we'll look at a situation of trying to navigate off the summit of Ben Nevis in poor visibility, which is much, much more dangerous, and how pacing techniques can help us get that right. And that's also a scenario where um, in any years other than right now, uh, taking care of magnetic variation would, uh, would be useful. So we'll look at that also. So anyway, let's uh, press on and uh, look at pacing first. So to get a grip on um, pacing then, what we need to know is how many paces do we take per 100 metres? Um, so you need to find something that's 100 metres long and walk along it and count your steps. Now, if you can't think of anywhere, then if you go to your local playing fields, where I am now, a full-size football pitch is 100 metres, give or take a couple of metres. So if you walk along the length of the football pitch, then that will give you a good indication. Rather than counting every step, you count double paces. So every time your right foot comes forward, for example, you, you count as a pace and uh, just see how many it takes to do the 100 metres. So here we are where the corner flag would be and we'll start counting. One, two, three, four, 59, 60, 61, 62 basically. Okay, so there we are. I've done 62 paces uh, for the length of the football pitch. Um, now, it's a good idea to do this maybe three, four times and then average it out because uh, when you're doing this sort of thing, you don't tend to walk naturally. Uh, but nonetheless, it gives me a good idea of what I do on flat ground at least. Um, and it's not dissimilar to the figure that I remember from the orienteering course I did going uphill or downhill it's likely to be uh, more paces maybe by as much as 15 percent or even 20 percent depending on the the gradient but at least you've now got an idea of how many double paces you do per 100 meters so we've worked out that i do 62 paces double paces per 100 meters so that's a, a good way of measuring out distance um, but the other thing we can do is uh, look to see how long it takes us to cover a particular leg. And to do this, the most commonly used rule it, uh, was cooked up by a guy called William Naismith in 1890 something or another. 
he was a Victorian hill walker and mountaineer. And he came up with a rule which is now known as Naismith's rule. And this rule is still in use today, albeit people tend to modify it uh, to suit their own abilities and circumstances. So this rule states that a walker will walk at five kilometers an hour on the flat. And when going uphill, we need to add on one minute for every 10 meter contour line that's crossed. Now this is a fairly ambitious uh, schedule to try and keep to and really ought to be considered as the, as the minimum. It assumes that you're pretty fit and the five kilometers an hour is assuming fairly easy ground. I tend to have found over the years that four kilometers an hour is a more realistic figure. And in fact, I think the um, mountain leadership courses in the UK tend to work on four kilometers an hour rather than five. Um, I've also found that as my knees have got older, because I'm no spring chicken, that I have to make a, a bit of an allowance for going down steeper slopes. So if the slope is 10 degrees or so or less, then I assume four kilometers an hour. But if the slope gets steeper than that, I actually add one minute per 10 meter contour line going downhill as well. So what you need to do really is take Naismith's rule, five kilometers an hour plus one minute for every 10 meter contour line crossed and just go out and, and practice it and see how it applies to you and then modify it to suit your own particular abilities and the ground that you're covering. But what we'll do now is have a, a look at this bearing leg that um, we've been using as our test leg and apply Naismith's rule to that and see how long it should take me to cover that particular leg. So the leg we're interested in is the summit of Galbarrow Fell by the 481 metre mark to the little shooting lodge that you can just see on the map there. So I'm going to draw a line between those two features now. So I've drawn my line and measured the distance between the two points at 650 metres. So in order to work out how long that would take if it was flat, we would assume we're walking at four kilometres an hour, uh, so that's 4,000 metres but we're only doing 650 metres. So the accurate calculation would be 650 metres divided by 4,000 and then times uh, 60 to get it to minutes. And that will give you basically just under 10 minutes, kind of 9.7 or something. The quick calculation though is to say that four kilometers an hour means one kilometer every 15 minutes 650 meters is roughly two-thirds of a thousand and so two-thirds of 15 minutes is 10 minutes so in your head you could work out it'll take you about 10 minutes to do that leg uh, the accurate way is 9.7 minutes odd so there's not much difference. So we're going to assume that we've done it all in our head because it's um, in reality, you might be doing this out on the hill where it's windy and cold and wet and you just want the quick calculation. So it'll take us 10 minutes to cover this route on the flat. So now we want to take account of the fact that um, we're going across contour lines, albeit downhill. Now, if you're uh, young with good knees you can probably ignore the downhill section here and just take the 10 minutes but for me with my old knees I'm going to want to make an allowance for the fact that I'm going downhill so I'm going to count the contour lines and this is where um, 
if you've got slightly dodgy eyesight, having the magnifying glass uh, is handy. But anyway, so looking at the map then, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I've got eleven contour lines that I'm crossing on this route. So there we are. Um, we've got 650 metres to walk. I know I do about 62 paces per 100 metres. So that's one uh, method to establish the how far we've gone along the route. And using my modified version of Naismith's rule, I reckon it's going to take me just under 10 minutes to do the walk if it was on the flat, but because it's descending and I've got dicky knees, I'm going to allow one minute per contour line crossed. We're crossing 11 contour lines, so that's an additional 11 minutes because of the terrain. So for me, it should take just over 20 minutes to do that particular leg. So that's the sort of uh, cross check, if you like. Um, yeah, so that's enough indoor work. Uh, let's get outside. On a completely different note, uh, I haven't had a haircut for three months, so I cracked last week and let Miss Camping Astronomer cut my hair. Um, I think she's probably done quite a good job, although it probably looks a bit scruffy at the moment. Um, but I'm just gonna turn my head round and then I can spot whether she's like, taken a big gouge out my hair and I haven't actually noticed it because I can't see it. But I think she's probably done quite a good job and won't be able to get my hair cut professionally for another six weeks or so I think. So um, I was quite pleased with what she did really, assuming there's not huge gouge marks on the back of my head. So here we are in the local woods then. And what I want to do now is do a cross check really between my pacing of 62 paces per 100 metres and my interpretation of Naismith's rule of four kilometres an hour on the flat. I can't simulate uh, going down Galbarrow Fell here in this bit of woodland, um, so I'm just going to do the cross check on the, the flat side of it, which Although Naismith says five kilometres an hour, I know for me it's more like four. So I'm going to count out a thousand metres and see how long it takes me to do it. Now one of the difficulties of counting out longish distance, like a thousand metres, is for me that's going to be 620 steps and the chances are I'm going to lose count. So what I've actually done is I've picked up uh, 10 small stones and every time I do 62 paces which is 100 meters I'm going to transfer one stone from one pocket to the other and so when I've got no stones left I know I've done 10 times 62 which is 620 paces and therefore one kilometer so there's my um, 10 small stones then that are going to live in my left pocket and every time I do 62 paces or in actual fact it's double paces remember I'm going to count every time my right leg goes forward I'm going to take a stone from the left pocket and put it in the right pocket and when I've used all the stones up I'm going to cross check with my watch to see how long it's taken me to do it four kilometers an hour ought to be quarter of an hour for one kilometre and it's quite a nice day today as well so a good day to be doing this sort of thing so it's just turned 11.43 so 15 minutes is 11.58 so I should have used all my stones up by sort of 11.58 and a half by the time I've actually got started so um, yeah let's get going three four nine 60, 61, 62. So now 
I'll take out one stone and transfer it to my other pocket and carry on. Right, I've got my last stone left, so that's my last 62 paces or my last 100 metres. And it's just about to turn 56, I think. 9, 60, 61, 62. And 11.57. So I'm actually between 30 seconds and one minute up on the timing schedule. And I suspect the reason for that is that I've been going faster than four kilometres an hour. And the reason for that is this is the type of path that I've mostly been walking on. So it's a really, really good path. And my four kilometres an hour rule assumes a typical mountain path which is uh, much, much uh, rockier than this path is here. So I had a um, stopwatch app going on my phone in the background. I couldn't show that to you because um, I actually do the film, most of my filming or all of my filming on my phone. And the stopwatch more or less corroborated what my wristwatch had said. And it turned out that I did the 620 steps 38 seconds faster than 15 minutes uh, so that's an error of basically four percent over what i thought which as i say is almost certainly due to the um, quality of the path that i was walking on so i think i can be reasonably confident that i do 62 steps per 100 meters on level ground and I walk at around four kilometres an hour, having corroborated those two to within 4%. So, uh, yeah, those, these are the sorts of things that you can practice and find out in your local park and vary Naismith's rule to suit yourself. So um, now I'm going to have a quick cup of uh, hot chocolate and a bit of a sausage roll because uh, it's more or less lunchtime. And then we'll... Um, come back and, and discuss a couple of more serious scenarios that you might be faced with. The uh, situation that we've been looking at in part one and part two of this little video series on Gal Barrow Fell <coughs> really isn't a serious situation at all. Um, the reason that I was keen to get it right was because I had my then 10 year old daughter with me and didn't want any uh, complications and if I'd been on my own I wouldn't have been in the slightest bit concerned. Having said that, knowing how to use a compass and take a bearing and how to walk along it and how to know where you are on that bearing uh, is a real useful skill and it's a, most of the time it's a a bit like a comfort blanket you know you, you don't actually need it for most of the time but every now and again it's a real handy skill to know and it's always worth having a pretty good idea of where you are on your route anyway because you never know when somebody might fall and uh, break their ankle for example or twist their ankle badly and suddenly you've got to get uh, mountain rescue out so you need to be able to tell them where you are but now we're going to look at a different situation away from the Lake District and up on the summit of Ben Nevis where it's a tricky navigation exercise to get off the summit if the weather's bad in good weather it's not really a problem but in bad weather you can have or, or mist it doesn't even have to be that much bad weather you can have a real problem getting off and that's what we're going to look at now and where the skills that we've been looking at in the last two videos become essential to help you get off safely. The top of Ben Nevis is the only place I've come across in the UK where there's actually a map at very large scale, one to twelve and a half thousand in this case, to help you navigate off the summit. Um, this map's my old Harvey's summit map. The reason this map's been produced is that the uh, summit area of Ben Nevis is surrounded by very large vertical cliffs where if you 
fell off the edge, uh, the chances are you'd probably die. And you can see here that the map gives you one bearing to follow for 150 metres, and then you take another bearing and follow that until you intersect the zigzag path off. So here the map's telling us that we need to take a bearing of 231 degrees and follow that for 150 metres, following which we take another bearing. If you don't know about pacing and timing techniques, then whether you've travelled 150 metres or not is up to your judgement. And this can be a bit of a tricky thing. So let's just assume that you think you've done 150 metres, but you've only done 80. And you take your second bearing, thinking you've reached the turn. So now you may be walking along the right bearing, but because you've turned too early, you're going to walk straight off the edge of Ben Nevis and fall down Gardaloo Gully, which will have extremely serious consequences. Now, it's very easy to think that there's kind of no way that you're just going to blindly walk off the edge of a 500 foot cliff. Um, but the top of Ben Nevis, probably at least half the time, wouldn't look dissimilar to what you can see now. And it can be a very, very disorienting place in the mist. And if there's snow on the ground, which there often is, I've been up there in August to a foot of snow, then it's almost impossible to distinguish the land from the sky, especially if it's misty. If there is snow on the ground, you've got the added complication of cornices. The edges of the gullies are highly likely to be corniced, which basically means that um, there's a couple of feet of snow sticking out over 500 feet of fresh air, and if you tread onto that cornice, then you're just going to fall through it and drop right to the bottom of the cliffs. But for now, let's just assume that we've done our pacing correctly and we've got to the 150 metre mark where we need to stop and take our new bearing. And the new bearing is 282 degrees and the intention is we follow that bearing until we hit the zigzag path away from the summit. Ordinarily, we'd have to take account of magnetic variation when doing this navigation exercise. But fortunately for us in the UK at the moment, the magnetic variation on the summit of Ben Nevis is less than a degree at the minute. When I started walking, though, the magnetic variation in the UK was around seven degrees, if I remember rightly. So let's just look now at the importance of knowing what the magnetic variation is because um, it's always worth checking and it does change year on year. So if you did have a modest magnetic variation that you didn't take account of then here's the sort of thing that could happen. Here we show a path reflecting an eight degree error because you haven't taken account of magnetic variation and this path will send you straight down into Five Finger Gully, where again you could suffer um, an extremely serious fall. So there we are, I'm off home now. Um, that situation there that I showed you on Ben Nevis, it, um, it's absolutely critical that you understand how to use a, a map and compass, how to take bearings, an understanding of timings and pacing. But the good news is that you can practice these things in your park and your woodland like I've done to, to get a kind of baseline figure that suits you. And then you can take them up in the hill having practiced them so that when you need them you actually know what you're doing. So I hope you found this video useful. The last video in the little three-part series that I'm going to do is going to cover what happens when you get lost. Uh, uh, locationally challenged is uh, the better word for it. Uh, what you can do to find out where you are in order to get yourself back on track. That video will be up in a couple of weeks time I reckon. Uh, so I'll see you next time. Cheerio.